may have read, this presentation is about um, growth rate changes in red snapper following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And just a short background to um, bring you into it. I work in a lab that studies all sorts of animal responses to uh, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So um, my lab was one of the first to go out and evaluate fish health in response to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill at least four other um, students in my lab, so my lab mates, are working on topics relating to fish health in response to the deepwater horizon oil spill. So I can probably answer any other questions that you might have that may not be specifically related to growth, but um, other topics. Okay, so um, as you may or may not know, oil spills are not extremely rare. Quite a few have happened within the past 50 years, um, though none of these rival the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which occurred back in 2010. Um, and this spill spilled more than 200 million US gallons of oil. And as a tidbit, a uh, much lesser known oil spill that spilled even more than this was that which occurred during the Gulf War. And a lot of people forget this because you know, it wasn't the United States, but I just like to share that. So um, during this oil spill, the oil spewed from the wellhead for about 89 days. And the oil made its way from the seafloor all the way up to the water column to the surface. And it passed through the water column and areas where important fishes reside. And when it, the oil reached the subsurface and the surface, it deposited uh, components of oil like polycyclic aromatic <coughs> hydrocarbons, which a lot of people refer to as PAHs, and those are highly carcinogenic, meaning they are cancer-causing, they cause cell toxicity. Um, some other compounds that are in uh, the Deepwater Horizon uh, crude oil are um, butanes, which I refer to as VTEX up here, and these are also highly carcinogenic as well as n alkanes. So <clears throat> there's a lot of a, a nice toxic slew in the Gulf of Mexico, and a lot of animals were residing in it. Um, so uh, there's been quite a bit of research on the effects at, of oil on development of fishes. A lot of this research actually came out of the Exxon Valdez spill. So, um, there's a lot of information on pink salmon, Pacific herring, juvenile sea bass. And uh, from, from these papers and this research, we know that um, direct exposure to oil, either through, through their gills, any kind of animal swimming through the oil, or consuming oil sediments or food, or living in oil sediments, so it, and being exposed transdermally can result in uh, decline in weight, condition, and growth of any of the fishes living in the area. And um, so some research have, researchers have theorized that these declines um, might result in a reduction in competitive edge. So if they have, um, if they're not growing so much, or if their condition is weakened, maybe they're just they are more sickly, they're not going to be able to compete for resources or habitat, which um, might result in increase in predation. So if they're weak, maybe they're not able to protect themselves from other predators, high-level predators that might be eating them. So all of these variables combined uh, potentially can result in severe um, loss in population productivity. Population productivity is basically what sustains important fish stocks. Okay, so if a stock is not productive, then there, there are long-lasting problems for our fisheries and our food supply. Um, so we were still sort of in the dark about how this oil spill would have fact affected demersal fish. Okay, so um, those fishes that live on the seafloor in the, in the benthos and they feed on contaminated sediment, because like I said, a lot of that research was done on juveniles, and it was also done in lab studies, okay, so it didn't exactly mimic real life scenarios. Um, also, perhaps, <clears throat> were the adults more resilient, were they? We're not sure. 
So we really weren't sure about that. As I said, the last studies were in juveniles. And we also weren't sure how long the effects of oil contamination would last. So um, <clears throat> there's one fish in particular that we decided to focus on to answer these questions, which is our nice friend red snapper. Actually, I've become quite friendly with this fish because I've been, <laughs> spent so much time working with them. They're quite beautiful if you've ever got a chance to see them in the wild. They're this really deep red color. They're, they're really nice and good to eat too. Um, OK, so um, red snapper, they are a demersal fish. So they, they live close to the seafloor, and they live in the vicinity of oil infrastructure. And in parts of the Gulf of Mexico, they have high site fidelity. And that's a term that's used to describe their home range. When they find a nice spot, they stick to it. So if an oil spill were to happen, and then they, in their area, they're not migratory, so they're probably not going to swim away. So that increases their chance of exposure. Now, they have something called a, an otolith. Okay, the technical term is a sagittal otolith. And the otolith is a tool that they give scientists to learn about their growth. It is a well-studied structure that I will tell you about um, in, a, in a few slides that all fishes have. And they are generally very well-studied and they record growth. So this is a nice tool that scientists can use to evaluate growth rate changes after any kind of environmental disturbance like an oil spill or, or anything else um, very marked. And as many of you may know, they are one of the most economically valuable fish in, in the Gulf of Mexico. They're highly sought after and right now um, the federal catch season I think is only 10 days. So it's Highly managed, very valuable fish. So it's something that we're very interested in. Okay, so um, for this study, I had four objectives, which I call the four E's. So I'll go through them one by one. And actually, for the duration of my talk, I'm going to go through objective through objective. So you'll all you'll sort of stay on track that way. Okay, so the first objective I had was to enhance knowledge of the aging growth structure of red snapper. There have been a lot of studies on red snapper in terms of their aging growth, but all of these studies happened well before the deep water horizon oil spill. A lot of this research happened, happened in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, even up until I think like 2005. Um, but there really weren't, this was the first study to evaluate their population level growth. So we wanted to, to evaluate this as a way to um, compare to the studies that happened before the spill. So this was our first objective. Um, the second objective was to evaluate yearly variation in growth before and after the Deepwater Horizon spill. Now the primary difference between yearly variation in growth and the first objective I spoke about is that Yearly variation in growth means growth happening at specific years, four, five, six. And that yearly variation is what can really affect um, an animal's ability to reproduce and create eggs. So about taking a, a closer look into yearly variation is also important. Um, the, the third objective was to then explore the role of environmental variables as potential drivers of growth variation. So if I had gone out and um, measured these uh, fish like I had, and I found a growth rate variation, I wouldn't really have a strong case to say, oh, it must be the oil spill, because there are many different variables that can influence growth. So I sort of, I had to explore these other um, variables. So that was the third objective, sort of rule them out, test everything I could to, to see what was causing these declines. Um, and then the fourth objective was to estimate productivity changes. Um, now, um, as I said, variation in growth and growth declines can affect overall population productivity. So a nice cap off of this study was to take the final step in estimating productivity. Okay, so how did I do this? Well, uh, like I said, this 
my project is part of a broader project to evaluate fish health in the Gulf of Mexico. So since 2011, um, my lab has gone out into the Gulf of Mexico and uh, has done scientific commercial longline studies, um, primarily aboard the research vessel Weatherbird 2, which is, an, uh, which is a Florida Institute oceanography vessel that is housed at the University of South Florida. And we go out sampling all through the Gulf. And these are multi-day trips. So um, actually, I think by now I have 50 sea days where I've been out at sea doing research. So this is a, a map of all the stations and the sites where we were able to catch red snapper and extract their otoliths from 2011 to, to 2013. Now, the size of the blue dot indicates the number of samples that were caught at each site. So you'll see that there's a high density of samples that we caught up in the, um, the Mississippi Delta area, which is where the Mississippi is um, spreading out into the Gulf and right around the wellhead, which is indicated by that, that black wellhead. So um, we have a lot of samples for this project. So um, we went out and for all the animals that we catch on board, we take all sorts of morphometric data, including their length, their weight, we extract their liver, we extract their muscle, we extract their bile, we extract their fin clips and eyeballs, everything. <laughs> These fish do not go to waste. All of the fish that we catch go to at least 10 different research projects, so they're highly studied. Um, and then finally, we extract sagittal otoliths, which is really important to me. So these sagittal otoliths, I, you extract them by either entering through their, gil, their um, gills, or um, a less pleasant way is to just um, crack their skull bone and uh, extract them that way, which is what we do because it's easiest. Anyway, so once we have these otoliths, we, I took them back to my lab and I processed them and analyzed them. So I will tell you how that went. Okay, so that first objective, bringing you back, to enhance the uh, knowledge of the aging growth structure via otolith aging procedure. So, yes. Otolith, is that a, like part of the bone structure? I'm, I'm about to tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so otoliths mm -hmm. are small calcium carbonate structures. In red snapper, they're about the size, the size of a quarter, okay? Every fish has an otolith. The size of the otolith generally is correlated to their, um, the amount of movement they have. So a lot of fish that spend their life at the bottom that are benthic fish have larger otoliths because it helps them with balance, proprioception, and navigating through their environment. Highly migratory fish like tuna have incredibly small otoliths. They are the size of a grain of sand. All fish have them, they just vary in size. So they are, they're made of calcium carbonate, very much like corals, and they reside within the endolymphatic sac system of the fish. Okay, so in, it's equivalent to our inner ear. So we use our inner ear as balance, and they have a similar structure that helps them with that, okay? Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so otoliths, every fish is born with a core otolith, upon which daily accretion occurs. Every day the fish is alive, the otolith deposits a matrix of calcium carbonate and protein, okay? Um, it's daily and it happens until the fish dies. It is, um, None of it reabsorbs, it is there, and it does not go away. It grows much like a tree does, where it has a center, and then the rings grow and grow and grow. Nothing reabsorbs, it's there permanently until you cut down the tree or kill the fish. Um, so, um, now, during times of slow growth, periods of slow growth, and for red snapper, Periods of slow growth would correspond to when they're preparing to spawn, so when they're storing a lot of energy. During January to June, those rings are uh, very finely spaced together. 
because the fish isn't growing a lot, because they're putting all of their energy reserves to making eggs. And these otoliths grow, are they're linked to the growth of the fish. So if the fish isn't growing very much, the otolith is not accreting very much either. So during the slow growing times, the otolith accretes material, but the material ends up appearing very finely spaced. And when you make a cross section of the otolith, you can actually see these finely spaced areas when you view them in certain light conditions. Okay? And that's what we call the opaque zone. Opaque, because you, you can't see through them, they're dark. Okay. Now, during times of fast growth, after they've spawned, they're free to do you know, whatever, they're free to grow instead of store energy, those um, daily rings are spaced much further apart and it makes a translucent zone. So when you view them under transmitted light, the zones are much widely spaced. Okay, so um, there is a slow growing zone and a fast growing zone for every year, which makes an opaque and translucent zone. So that one year of growth, the opaque plus translucent zone, is what we call one annual growth increment. Okay? So every year a fish is alive, there will be an annual growth increment recorded on the otolith. Okay? So if you take these otoliths and slice them transversely with a very slow speed saw, with um, nice blades, they're diamond encrusted because these things are wicked hard. Um, so if you slice them, you can actually view the slices under a microscope and then you're, you're able to see the banding pattern. Okay, so uh, for example, this is a cross-section of the otolith right where I have my pointer, and they have a red box around the area where you can best see the banding pattern, okay? So here, there are seven opaque bands. I know for sure because I counted them multiple times. So I know because there are seven opaque bands, this fish is seven years old. And by counting these opaque bands, we can get a lot of information about how old the fish is, and how much the fish has grown in all of the years of its life, okay? Because like I said, the growth of the fish is linked to the growth of the otolith, okay? The, the otolith is linked to the anabolic activity. Growing, growing, growing. It'd be like if we had a recorder in our inner ear that recorded how much we grew between age you know, zero and one and one to two and then all the way to the time where we plateaued and then started shrinking. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're growing out. <laughs> okay, so um, when we combine the length data of all the fish that I said we collected with the aging data, we can learn about their growth pattern. Okay, so this is this overall growth pattern that I spoke about, okay? Um, this is a really nice graphic. I think it does a great job of showing what we mean by, by population level growth or um, overall growth of the fish. So um, on the x-axis, which is the horizontal axis, is, uh, is time, okay? Or age, any kind of time variable. And on the y-axis is our length, okay? So this, this curve is best described by a standard growth equation called the von Bertalanffy growth equation, which was developed in 1951, I believe, um, by a very famous fishery scientist. So um, with age and length data, they're able to derive the important parameters of the equation listed uh, where I listed right here. And then we are also able to gain information about their weight pattern, okay? Um, because in fish, weight, the weight relationship is basically the cube of length, um, we are able to derive weight information from this length parameter, which we've derived from this nice equation. So it's, it's quite nice how it works out. Anyway. So, of 812 otoliths, we were able to make nice histograms to show the age distribution through the years 
of our cash. So there are two primary things happening here. First of all is this progression of the mode. And by mode I mean the, there are most numbers of these animals in these years. So in 2011 we saw mostly five years old and they progressed the following year as six year olds and then the following year as seven year olds, which um, is, it frequently happens, so it's nice to see that. But another thing is that in 2012, we were not able to find the fish that would have spawned in 2010. And that's peculiar, because in the year before, we were seeing age two and age three fish. But in 2012, we weren't seeing any two-year-old fish. And like I said, those were the 2010 cohort. And we might think that perhaps those fish, the, the larval fish, encountered vast amounts of carcinogenic compounds and they could not withstand the toxicity they were encountering. And then we saw the same thing again in 2013. Um, we don't see any three-year-olds, which would have been that 2010 cohort, as well as those two-year-olds. And um, that's actually not something that I have just seen, but also the CDAR report, which is the federal assessment report of Red Snapper, and several other researchers have also actually seen this. It's not just me. Anyway, like I said, taking all this age and length data, we can um, make nice growth curves and compare them between the recovery years. So the growth curve in 2011 is presented. We were able to derive those curves for 2012 as well as 2013. And we can compare them all together to see if there was any kind of recovery or if there's any kind of difference in these growth curves in, these year, in the years following the deepwater horizon spill. So through some statistical metrics, I found that they actually weren't different which is fine. It's, it's good to know what our results are. They weren't different. And we actually find that when we plot them against the growth studies and the growth curves that were estimated in all those studies before the Deepwater Horizon, we find that they're actually not significantly different. Okay, so a curve from a, a Wilson et al. paper, um, he, Chuck Wilson, is a very famous red snapper scientist, I believe, at um, University of Alabama, and Will Patterson, again, another big red snapper guy. So we don't see a significant difference in our overall curves before and after the Deepwater Horizon spill, but like I said, it's really important to take a second step and look deeper into the, the yearly growth variation, because that's where changes in um, fecundity or the ability to produce eggs Okay. So, like I said, the second objective was to evaluate yearly variation in growth. Now what's really important here is how, I, how I'm going to do this. Okay, so the otolith gives me a nice record of the yearly growth variation because we, we went over about how their increments grow and we know that there's an opaque and translucent zone every year. Okay, so I just I want to show you a nice cross section. If we were to take that nice picture that we saw and sort of turn it into a schematic, and I'll show you how our increments are labeled. So, let's say we have a four and a half year old fish that we caught in August of 2011. By counting back the number of rings, based upon the principle that each one of those happens every year for the life of the fish, I can know that that kind of fish would have hatched in May to September of 2007. From that time till about May to June of the following year, it has very slow growth and it makes that first opaque zone, which we've identified as the first increment, that first annual growth increment. Now, following that slow growth, it undergoes a period of fast growth from July to December, based upon our predefined rules of overland growth. And that is followed by slow growth again when they're probably getting ready to spawn because they're probably reaching maturity. So there's that second increment. Again, this happens with the third increment. Okay, so by this time we can see that these increments are being measured from June to June. 
okay, because they're being measured based upon the defined rules of otolith growth and the, the uh, axis upon which we're measuring the otolith. So this continues until we catch the fish in August of 2011, where it is four and a half years old. So um, what's important here is not that the growth declines every year, because obviously, um, you know, as fish grow, they grow less and less each year, okay? So we do expect age-related growth declines. This, the first growth increment will always be much thicker than the third or fourth growth increment, just by rules of, of growth, and we grow the same way. You know, in our final years of growing, we'll never grow as much as we did when we were infants. Um, but what's really important here, my golden nugget, is any change in the expected amount that a fish grows from year to year is going to be reflected by a change in the otolith growth. Okay? So we are not comparing growth among years meaning the growth at age three compared to the growth at age seven, we are comparing growth within years, okay? So for example, age, the average growth at age three in multiple different years, okay? And that is how we are able to evaluate growth, age-specific growth before and after um, any kind of catastrophic event like the Deepwater Horizon. So like I said, we'll compare the widths of age-specific annual income. Okay, so how are we supposed to get age-specific annual increments over multiple years if um, you know we only have we only have a few? Well, we go out and we do multiple years of fishing. So, like I said, all of these data are coming from fishing events that happened in 2011 to 2013. So, in a very simplistic example, we can take our otolith and, and sort of tilt its axis. So this nice, this dashed diagram that I just posted is, is basically what we just saw, that schematic of the otolith, but just put it on its side. So it's a four and a half year old fish, and um, in the rare event that we went out in all three years and only caught four and a half year old fish, we still would have a really nice sample of the third increment, third growth increment, before, during, and after the deep water horizon still, okay? So we have a third increment happening in 2009, a third increment happening in 2010, and a third increment happening in 2011. So we have power of our time series and our multiple sampling efforts, and we have power in the fact that we caught a crap ton of samples, thousands and thousands of samples that, that make this a really nice study, okay? So um, we ended up having a really nice sample of um, increments three through seven, okay? And we ended up having the average increments spread out all over all of these years. Even though we just went fishing in these years, we were catching really old fish, like eight-year-old fish, so I could count back and see how big their third increment was. So it follows along that logic. Plot these growth increments against each other, we end up with a plot like this. So this is sort of busy. I'm going to step through it one bit at a time. Okay, so on the x-axis, we have year, okay? Y-axis is the increment width, okay? I measured all of these increment widths under a microscope. I spent days looking at these teeny tiny little increments. Months, rather, not days. Such a fast project, that would be great, but no, months. Um, so, growth increment, the fourth growth increment, the fifth, sixth, and seventh. Now, like I said, we are not comparing among growth increments, we're comparing within, okay? So, let's look at the fourth growth increment. We see that there is an average um, width of that increment in 2007, which looks to be about the same as 2008 and 2009. But in 2010, that growth increment, which we measured from June to June, really takes a significant decline, okay? And then the following year, it starts to recover to that pre-spill average, okay? 
Now we find that this happened not only for the fourth increment, but also for the fifth and the sixth increment. Okay, so there are these significant growth declines that we see in the um, <clears throat> in the fish of the the growth years presented here, and these increments correspond to growth years four, five, and six. And fish of that those ages are are highly sought after in the commercial fishery. Okay, so these are the most productive fish. So um, to sort of explore the role of environmental <coughs> variables, which is important, it's necessary to follow up your research with exploration of other kinds of um, you know, variables. Maybe there are other, other reasons why these growth changes happen. I looked at four variables. Um, the first variable was uh, Mississippi River discharge. And this is important because the Mississippi River discharges a lot of nutrients every day because we know that that area of the country is uh, has is a huge ag area tons of fertilizers and nutrients are being washed out of the mississippi river into the gulf of mexico and those nutrients support primary and secondary productivity okay primary at the very base level okay the phytoplankton the zooplankton and then the secondary productivity like animals that um, red snapper are eating. Okay, so perhaps there was an increase or decrease in the amount of nutrients that washed out of the river in 2010, and that's why the red snapper at those years aren't growing. So we had to look at that. And these data were easily accessible through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers because they have river flow data at many different sites along not only the Mississippi River, but many different rivers in the country. I also looked at wind speed. Okay, so um, wind speed is very important for water overturning. As the wind blows across the water, it puts stress on the top layers of water column. And it causes um, some physical, um, uh, physical phenomena called wind stress curl, which, which forces the water from the surface down into the water column through a, a physiological, uh, sorry, a physical process called Ekman pumping. Um, so that's just a, sh a short background. But basically, if the wind is blowing stronger <coughs> in varying directions, perhaps it was causing a lot of the surface nutrients pushed down into the water column, and that might have either supported growth or maybe there really wasn't any, any circulation happening from the upper levels. And maybe that's why there was slow growth in 2010. So that's another um, example of how, why we want to look at that kind of variable. The fourth variable was sea level anomaly. Okay, so sea level anomaly is an, is an indicator of the amount of heat stored in the upper water column of the ocean. Okay. Um, obviously, we know that heat causes things to expand. So if there's a lot of heat stored in the top of the water column, that sea level is going to increase because the water is expanding. And fish grow best in a very defined window of heat. Okay? So if the water is cool, maybe they're having to deal with the stress of colder waters, and that's why they weren't growing. Okay? So all four of these were really important to explore. So with each one of these variables, I made a, a monthly average okay, during the red snapper growing season. I know that red snapper are growing from June to December. So for every variable, I made a monthly average. Okay? So for example, Mississippi River discharge, I made a, an average of the I need an average of the discharge coming out of the Mississippi for the month of June all the way through the December. And I did that for every variable uh, that, I just, that I just told you about. So going through um, the results of all these variables, we find that um, U winds, which are those east-west winds I spoke about, were not significant in describing the variability that we saw in those growth rate time series. 
okay? So, they, so the variation in, in those winds don't describe the variation that we see in the increments, okay? Um, finally, uh, east-west winds, again, not significant, okay? So we've explored our wind parameters. They don't seem to be driving any of the variability. We've been, we explored that wind stress curl parameter, okay, causing that overturning. Again, not significant in describing any of the variability that we saw in those, in those work rate changes. And we did the same for that river discharge and again, sea level anomaly. So at this point, we don't find, we haven't found any variable that can actually describe the variation we saw in the growth. So we have no alternative to describe the variation. So we really cannot reject the hypothesis that oil contamination may have caused those declines. Okay, so that's how we present it in the literature. We've explored all of these variables. Um, none of them seem to describe the variation we see, so we cannot reject the hypothesis that oil caused oil caused the variation, which is just a, a a way to get around this statistical target. Anyway, so the final final objective was just to explore um, productivity changes. We <coughs> did this through something called back calculation. It's based upon an equation that I'll walk you through. It's not confusing. I'll explain every parameter. So we take the length of the fish at capture and we pair that with the length of the fish at hatching, which is just um, a ton of people have done research on how long the fish are when they hatch, so it's an average number that I put into this equation or anyone who puts it into these kinds of equations. And then we take our otolith radius at age. Okay, so this is important. If we want to back calculate the length at a certain age, we just use the otolith. So for example, this is probably like an otolith from a seven-year-old fish or a six-year-old fish. We want to know how, how long it was at age three. We use the radius at that age. So from the very center of the otolith to the radius occurring at that age, that third increment. We combine it with that radius at capture, so the, the distance from the center all the way to the outer edge, and the radius at hatching, which again comes from literature, and we're actually able to evaluate the length at age of these fish, okay? And then, in, in, based upon this relationship, I'm actually able to make a nice plot of length at age through these years. So this is the same thing as overlift increment at age, but this is just length. Again, we have year on the x-axis, length on the y-axis, and you can track the length of average of the fish at age three over all of over all of these years, okay? Now using that equation way back when, where I told you that weight is related to length, we can make this same plot with, with weight, okay? Again, this is the same plot, but this is just average weight over years at these ages. And this is what's important because weight is the variable that defines how much how many eggs these fish are able to produce. It doesn't matter how long you are, it matters how 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 much you weigh, because that's how 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 much how many eggs you can store and how much extra tissue reserves you might have to reproduce, right? You could be tall and lanky and really thin, but not very healthy. But, but you know, fish needs to be plump and healthy and full of reserves. So by by evaluating differences in these um, in these weight um, variables um, and evaluating the significant difference between years, we can tell that in years before the spill, okay, the spills in 2010, there were two significant increases in the weight at age, okay? But what's striking here is that in years after the spill and just before 2010, there were a lot of significant declines in weight, okay? So that's what's, what's really important. And we feel like these declines in weight could have really significantly impacted productivity of these fishes. So to conclude here, before my timer goes off, <laughs> um, we saw a progression of that cohort, and we feel like we are missing recruitment in those years post Deepwater Horizon. 
We also observed a significant decline in the that fourth, fifth, and sixth increment. Okay? By exploring the environmental parameters, we find none of them are able to describe the variability that we saw in the growth changes. And finally, we saw these post deepwater horizon declines in weight, which indicate some kind of substantial loss in population productivity. 